Okay, continuing now. Remember Santa Vito, one of the key players, and uh, sees me as perhaps the key player in what we're going to be looking at this evening. Continuing, from Middle East of July of 81. The right gained control of sees me and managed to ensure that the parliamentary and ministerial committees charged with political control over both services were unable to interfere. As a consequence, both increasingly became the instruments of the unending war between different factions within the establishment. Sizdi, S-I-S-D-E, is generally more Arab, uh, more pro-Arab and pro-left, and Sizmi works closely with the CIA and other Western and pro-Western security services, including the Israeli Mossad. It also has links with both local and international rightist organizations. We'll look at those later. <coughs> Continuing. By 1977, the Italian police were making great headway in their struggle against terrorism. Almost all the original leaders of the Red Brigades had been arrested, and right-wing subversion had been reduced to a minimum. But a secret document attributed to the CIA, whose authenticity the American agency denied, advocated encouraging the continuation of terrorism so that the networks could be infiltrated until they were virtually controlled by the security apparatus. Thus it was alleged, this it was alleged, would make possible the wholesale criminalization of the Marxist and liberal left, providing a pretext for the repressive measures deemed necessary to keep Italy in the Western camp and prevent its slide toward non-alignment disarmament and particularly an independent Middle East strategy. Certainly at this time, the Red Brigades and their right-wing counterparts enjoyed a sudden, unexpected upsurge which reached a climax in the Morrow case. This ended any chance of communist participation in government which would have undermined U.S. plans to make Italy's, n Italy NATO's aircraft carrier, unquote, in the Mediterranean. Terrorist leaders arrested over the past two years after brief and spectacular careers have mostly proved to be very ready to repent, unquote, and confess. And their confessions have provided legal justification for a further clampdown on the left and for press campaigns against Arab and specifically Libyan and Palestinian support for European terrorism, unquote. Efforts by Premier Francesco Cossiga of the Christian Democratic Left to increase Siste's powers were foiled by sisme inspired attacks on its leadership. Confidential statements to the judge by repentant Red Brigade leader Patrizio Pecci had described the prominent role in the Prima Linea terrorist group of the son of Carlo Donat Catin, C-A-T-T-I-N, leader of the Christian Democratic anti-communist right. These were leaked to the daily Il Massaggero, and Silvano Russomano, deputy chief of Sisde, was help, held responsible. Russomano went to prison, and Sisde was discredited. A lot of things in this passage to look at, uh, starting with the very last point, taking a look at the allegedly leftist terrorist group Prima Linea, and the fact that one of its key principles was of a rightist and the son of a prominent Christian democratic anti-communist. Well, uh, we've seen Prima Linnea in our last broadcast when a judge named Alessandrini, who was investigating Roberto Calvi's and P2's financial machinations, was, right at the time when he began not only investigating P2, but other right-wing terrorism, gunned down by the very Prima Linnea terrorist group, which was just referred to. Supposed left-wing terrorist group. Now, we're looking at a pattern here uh, of that we're going to be developing for quite some time, and it's going to figure prominently in the broadcasts to come. Namely the killing of someone supposedly by the left whose actions were about to benefit the very left, and, of course, that killing then serving to discredit the left. In this case, the prominent player here is Aldo Moro. And before we get to Aldo Moro, and from there to a variety of other things, uh, the strategy of tension in general and the further... Um, infiltration of Sismi into every uh, every possible uh, area of political life and uh, the the cross uh, infiltration of Sismi by P2 we are going to take a break so I want to mention to you broadcasting from Foothill College this is KFJC Los Altos Hills uh, Dave and I will be back after just a couple of minutes since you've all been sitting for about an hour those of you who are listening and uh, we will continue with Radio Free America and, of course, we are here in the studios of KFJC. And uh, we're going to recap the last article, and we're going to go on to talk a little bit about Seize Me and Lisio Jelly and P2. Basically, what the last article called, appropriately enough, Italy's Secret Service Wars was about was just that. It was how, like with so many other countries at the end of World War II, the United States and Britain, in reconstituting Italy's Secret Service, basically simply reinstalled the same fascist elements who had performed intelligence functions for Benito Mussolini for the better part of two decades. Now, as a result of that, there was an ongoing conflict between the democratic dictates of the Italian political uh, constitution 
and the practices and, and political aspirations of its security services. This resulted in a program not only of state terrorism by those security services, but in the periodic dissolution, dissolution, dissolution excuse me, and realignment of those very same security services. Now, what we got out of, eventually, the Italian Secret Service Wars, as it could be termed, was a bifocal Italian service intelligence system with two services, SISDE, the less, the more progressive and less powerful, and the SISMI. And in particular, one of the names to remember with the SISMI, the SISMI, the more reactionary and more powerful of the Italian Secret Services, is the name Giuseppe Santovito, a P2 member who we're going to come back to a little later. Now, in the beginning of the broadcast, we took a look at the Strategy of Tension, a program by Italian fascist Stefano Della Chiai to attribute bombings to the left to not only discredit the left, but precipitate a fascist coup. He was joined in this not only by the CIA with money going through Michele Sindona, another P key P2 member, but also with a, with a man named Guido Giannatini, an SID member, a P2 member, and a fellow we're going to be looking at a little later. Now, we were looking at how... In 1977, just as the Red Brigades and fascist terrorists were being effectively subdued by the Carabinieri, the Italian militia, how, according to uh, Middle East Magazine, and we're going to look at information which will work to corroborate this in our subsequent broadcasts, the CIA, among others, advocated the, I guess you could say, the restarting up of terrorism, the resurgence of terrorism, as a means of not only infiltrating those, those very same terrorist groups, but obviously using those for political reaction, to promote political reaction. Specifically, we, we left off looking at the kidnapping and assassination of Aldo Moro by the Red Brigades. Moro, the uh, Prime Minister of Italy, was in the business, uh, or was in the process, I should say, of incorporating the communists into Italian government for the first time. Italy has uh, what I believe is still the largest communist party in all of Western Europe, and it's also uh, a very powerful and effective communist party, also very democratic, by the way, and uh, which may, which leads us uh, to perhaps question, as we will a little later, just where the Red Brigades come from. But uh, Aldo Moro was, was becoming the first Italian head of state to incorporate the communists as part of a center-left coalition. At that time, at that precise moment, the Red Brigades kidnapped and murdered Aldo Moro, obviously creating a, a great deal of disfavor for the left. It should be noted that in that capacity, the Red Brigades acted in accordance with the wishes not only of the United States Intelligence Services, but also of fascists all over Italy, including Licio Gelli of the P2 Lodge. Okay, now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to read an article entitled, Wanted Men Enjoying Power, from the New Statesman of September 21st, 1984. Research credit on this goes to Ted Rubenstein also. Um, they're going to refer to the Anselmi Commission, and we probably will refer to the Anselmi Commission a couple times in the next few stories. The Anselmi Commission is an Italian parliamentary commission investigating the P2, and uh, Tina Anselmi is the woman who is a, a, a major uh, a Christian Democrat uh, political uh, personage who headed up this commission. The Anselmi Commission, the New Statesman writes, um, uh, do we have the author? No, okay. Um, Donald Sassoon, excuse me, is the author of this piece. The Anselmi Commission tried to piece together the career of the P2's mysterious leader, Licio Gelli, who escaped to Switzerland, was arrested by the authorities, and escaped again to South America, where he is still presumed to be. In 1943, Gelli was actively cooperating with the SS in Italy. And inserting parenthetically, uh, Dave and I have mentioned in the past that Licio Gelli actually held rank as an Oberleutnant, um, an Oberlieutenant in the SS. Shortly afterwards, as a precautionary measure, he also helped the partisans. Thanks to this, quote, insurance, he was cleared of fascist activities after the war and, it is alleged, became a common form agent. A document proving his involvement with Eastern European agents was used by the Italian Secret Services to blackmail Jelly into becoming one of their agents in 1950. Little is known of his activities until 1963. He was, for a period, in Argentina where he established contacts with fascists and Nazi exiles, as well as with the Argentinian Freemasonry. Back in Italy, he became a businessman, joined the Freemasons officially in 1963, and in 1966 entered the secret lodge Propaganda Due, P2. Since then, and until 1975, Jelly was directly involved in subversion. The Anselmi Report maintains that Jelly was con connected with the death of left-wing publisher Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli in 1971 and with the founding of the Red Brigades. 
Let me read that again. Jelly was connected with the death of left-wing publisher John Giacomo Feltrinelli in 1971 and with the founding of the Red Brigades. While maintaining his contacts with, quote, left terrorism, Jelly was taking part in the organization of an attempted right-wing coup d'etat. This was planned for the beginning of December 1970 under the leadership of Prince Valerio Borghese, a hero of the fascist republic of Salo. Okay, a couple of things to point out very quickly. Uh, first of all, we talked at great length about Licio Gelli's activities on behalf of the SS, his involvement with the Rat Line with Cardinal Montini, who later became Pope Paul VI, working with people like Klaus Barbie and Freddy Schwend to get um, them and other Nazis out of Europe, working also with American intelligence to the best of our ability to discover. Um, what's also important here, again, now he did have this quote-unquote insurance policy of working, um, as we mentioned earlier, with the partisans, what he would do was was uh, think on the partisans and uh, turn them over to the SS, and then just before the SS showed up, he would call the partisans, apparently, and then tell them to get out, and this way played both sides against the middle. Now, it's interesting that he had these connections with quote-unquote Eastern European agents, as I mentioned in this New Statesman article, because, of course, um, the whole Bulgarian thing has very strongly to do with connections, apparently by P2 members, with Eastern European arms and drug smugglers, okay? So that's something to bear in mind, that Licio Gelli himself has some contacts into Eastern Europe, of what type we do not know. The other thing, of course, the most important thing in this article is, again, um, according to the Anselmi Commission, an Italian parliamentary commission explicitly studying the P2, Licio Gelli was connected with the founding of the Red Brigades. And as Dave mentioned earlier, the Red Brigades, um, in many cases, used as an excuse for uh, cracking down on the left. And in the murder of Aldo Moro, the Red Brigades practically put um, the death rattle into the throat of uh, communist participation in Italian politics. And as we will say later in the broadcast, not only was that a major blow um, on behalf of the Italian right wing, but that was also very high in the political agenda of the United States intelligence services. And we're going to be looking at Western connections to the Red Brigades a little later. We'll call it on Radio Free America number 4, our program about Turple and Wilson and uh, the CIA help for Gaddafi, and we'll come back to that later in this series as well. We looked at the fact that among the groups that were aided by Turple and Wilson, who were not ex-CIA at all, as we looked at in that program, was the very same were the very same Red Brigades. The next article also, and continuing with some of the interesting connections between Liceo Gelli and the Red Brigades that were turned up by the uh, Italian Parliamentary Commission on P2, uh, research credit for this also goes to Ted Rubenstein. This comes from The Economist of May 19, 1984. The article is from The Economist's Rome correspondent headline, The P2 Time Bomb Goes Off. Skipping down into the article about Tina Anselmi and the Italian Parliamentary Commission on P2. Their Rome card, The Economist's Rome correspondent writes as follows. Miss Anselmi claimed that Mr. Jelly and his men protected terrorists of both the extreme right and left. The report quotes right-wing terrorists who described meeting the lodge master in his suite at Rome's Excelsior Hotel where Mr. Jelly is alleged to have met Mr. Longo. That's uh, Dimitri Longo, a P2 member and the budget minister for the current, well, he was forced to resign for the socialist government of Bettino Craxi. Continuing, the terrorists claim that Mr. Jelly financed their group, Ordine Nero. Miss Anselmi, by the way, that's to be distinguished from Ordine Nuovo that we're going to be looking at later in the broadcast. This is Ordine Nero. Um, but, of course, Ordine Nero, or, or Black Order, is also one of the groups that was involved in the fascist action in the streets following the Piazza Fontana bombings that we talked about earlier, along with Ordine Nuovo, or New Order. About uh, the par Parliamentary con Commission on P2, again, Miss Anselmi also discusses the accusations that the police were inefficient during the kidnapping and murder of the Christian Democratic leader Aldo Moro by the Red Brigades in 1978. She points to testimony that Mr. Jelly attended a meeting of top police investigators during the kidnapping to discuss the political aims of the terrorists. Mr. Jelly is thought to have been hostile to cooperation between the Christian Democrats and the Communists, which Moro fostered. So we not only have reports of Licio Jelly, and this from the Parliamentary Commission investigating P2 for the Italian government, we not only have reports that Licio Jelly founded the Red Brigades, but that he, he apparently was actively involved with the Carabinieri who were allegedly investigating the kidnapping of Aldo Moro. Recall that his kidnapping and murder not only eliminated, for the time being, the only person willing to establish a working political relationship between the communists and the other uh, segments of the Italian political spectrum, but it also massively discredited the Italian left, not only in Italy, but abroad as well. 
Okay, now we're going to be looking at some contacts, um, <clears throat> excuse me, between Italian intelligence and, of course, the, the right wing, and also a very interesting man by the name of Francesco Pazienza, who is going to be a repeating figure all throughout the remainder of these broadcasts. Um, what we are reading from are a series of translations done by Jonathan Marshall, uh, provided to us by Ted Rubenstein. Rubenstein. And uh, Jonathan Marshall is, I believe, he is, is he still working for... Uh, he's, he's still editorial page editor for the uh, Oakland Tribune, formerly working in that same capacity with the San Jose Mercury here in the South Bay. That's right. So in places, the syntax is a little teeny bit strange. Again, uh, credit should go, rather than, uh, than criticism of the syntax, credit for the, uh, the magnitude of the translations involved should go to Jonathan Marshall. Okay, this first little section here is from the newspaper L'Europeo, or L'Europeo, um, of November 3rd, 1984. And uh, the man that they're talking about here is um, Admiral Musumeci, oh, General, excuse me, General Pietro Musumeci, who is a high official of SISMI. SISMI, again, remember, is the military secret intelligence as opposed to SISDE, which is the domestic civilian intelligence, which was being rapidly discredited by the right wing to allow SISMI to gain in power in Italy after the reorganization of the security services. Okay, so this is General Pietro Musumeci that they're talking about. Uh, Musumeci was involved in the Cirillo case, sending Sismi agents in to see Camorra boss Raffaele Cutolo in jail. Okay, um, real quickly, right. the Camorra is a Sicilian, the Sicilian, uh, the equivalent of the mafia. Ne Neapolitan. Neapol I'm sorry, excuse yep. me, you're so absolutely right. Basically, the, Neo the Neapolitan uh, crime syndicate, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, by the way, this is a case we're going to be coming back to in our last broadcast. Uh, Cirillo is a Christian Democratic member of Parliament who was kidnapped for ransom by the Red Brigades. That's the Cirillo referred to here. That's right. Okay, so Dave is absolutely right. The mafia is Sicilian, the Camorra is Neapolitan, but they are both, again, you know, underworld crime syndicates. Okay. Musumeci was involved in the Cirillo case, sending Sismi agents in to see Camorra boss Raffaello Cutolo in jail to open negotiations with the Camorra and the Red Brigades. Three Brigades members were transferred here from other prisons to facilitate the talks. All illegal, and Musumeci knew it. He had the prison records changed to hide the facts. Why did he do this? Quote, Sismi wanted to remain alone in control of the operation, unquote, writes the Republican Senator Libero Gualtieri, president of the committee that controls the Secret Services. In order to deviate from the initial object, which was to, to discover where Cirillo was being held and arrest the kidnappers through exerting pressure on the Camorra milieu, and to be able to realize instead a more complicated objective, to obtain the liberation of Cirillo through, through negotiations, in which the ransom paid to the BR constituted only a part of the exchange, and the agency of counterparts high in Cutolo's organization, elevated to the rank of intermediaries between the state and the terrorists, was equally necessary. The committee, the committee report, maintains that the Cirillo case was hatched by the parallel SISMI, super SISMI. What we should mention here is that um, despite the fact that SISMI military intelligence was already predominantly right wing, the super SISMI was not unlike the Propaganda Due, the P2 Lodge, in that the super SISMI, as a matter of fact, almost every member of the super SISMI was in P2. It was a parallel and much more actively involved, a parallel uh, intelligence force operating out of the regular SISMI and almost exclusively seemingly concerned with a uh, directly fascist agenda. That's the super SISMI. The SISMI had was put together by elements in the Italian uh, national security establishment who were afraid of an eventual uh, democratic ascension to power of the Communist Party. We're putting the super SISMI together not only to help prevent that, but to overthrow it if it should happen. Okay, the committee report maintains that the Cirillo case was hatched by the parallel SISMI, super SISMI, to raise the quotation of its own power in symphony with the project of P2, which inspired it. Now his arrest sends a new and heavy blow against the credibility of the state and the security services. In his orbit was the businessman, this is Musumeci they're talking about, in his orbit was the businessman, lavishly stipended by the secret services, Francesco Pazienza. Through his lawyer, he has revealed that SISMI, directed by Giuseppe Santavito, also a member of P2, but piloted energetically by Musumeci for three years, 78 to 81, operated through a parallel structure completely illegally, he described some of its operations, which he said came under the head of counter-espionage. Skipping down, L Lura Peo asks, Are the Secret Services destined periodically to enter the sites of the judges? Robert Cavallero, a secret agent who had a role in some older plots, 
told Europeo, quote, The security services particularly press their alliances with the underworld and with terrorism and create dreadfully compromising networks. It is a sort of clique that directs the big affairs and parallel politics, unquote. Another more important subversive, Aldo Tisse, T-I-S-E-I, has said, I revealed many particulars to the magistrates because I was made exclusively an instrument in the hands of the secret services. In our group, there were unsuspected people, also members of the Carabinieri. Well, these weren't simply sympathizers, as might be thought, unquote. The organization Tisse speaks of is the one that murdered judges Vittorio Ocorsio and Mario Amato, the first to discover the link between the secret services, the underworld, and terrorism. The same organization which attempted to assassinate the head of Chile's Christian Democrats, Bernardo Leighton, and which organized the Bologna Massacre. The Bologna Massacre here referred to as the Bologna Railway Station bombing that killed some 80 people and uh, also was, uh, as far as we know, was organized by Licio Gelli. By the way, it's also worth noting the attempted assassination of Bernardo Leighton, which was performed by Stefano della Chiai, and we're going to come back to that later. Um, and uh, de, de, uh, Stefano della Chiai, of course, also involved in the Bologna Railway Station bombing. Now Rome's judge, Domenico Sica, has ordered the arrest of Musumeci and three collaborators, Colonel Secondo Delizio, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Giuseppe Belmonte, and Captain Valentino Artin, Artingeli, all in counter-espionage, and Francesco Pazienza. Quote, the secret services, said Cavallero, exercise strict control over terrorist groups. When I began to work for the services, these people asked me whether I wanted to work with the right or the left. I chose the right, more familiar terrain, unquote. Is there in circulation some other Cavallero who works on the left? Is there a connection between the secret services and the Red Brigades, besides the negotiations over Cirillo? The judges are now appraising the last particulars in the inquiry into journalist Mino Pecorelli, affiliated with the Secret Services. It seems key pages of his diary relating to the Moro case are missing, and the deposition given by Colonel Nicolo Bozo to verify if the investigation into Red Terror were entwined, intertwined in some way with supersedes me. Colonel Bozo explained that, quote, there was a power group inside the Pastrengo division of the Milan Carabinieri. The Carabinieri, of course, are the police. This group was affiliated with the P2 Lodge, and had in Musumeci one of its inspirations. It was a group that acted against General Carlo Alberto Dalla Chiesa and which seemed to bridle each time the general got appreciable results against the Red Brigades. Okay, so the Secret Services, the Seize Me and a subgroup of Seize Me, the so-called Super Seize Me, are uh, quite apparently, according to the uh, testimony given here and uh, events that we've looked at and are going to be looking at, playing both sides of the fence with regard to terrorism. We looked at Guido Giannatini, an SID and P2 member's role in the Piazza Fontana bombing, and we're going to be looking at his connections with other people later on. And uh, as indicated here, with uh, this, uh, the Cavallero here, Roberto Cavallero, working for the Super Seize Me, and he says basically when he went to work for them, they asked him, well, would you like to work with the right or with the left? It's worth noting that uh, Mino Pecarelli, a P2 man whose death we're going to look at here in just a second, Mino Pecarelli's diary was missing some key pages with regard to the Moro case. Take that in consideration with Licio Gelli's apparent uh, intercession with the Carabinieri looking for Moro, or allegedly looking for Moro, and with the uh, assertion by the Italian Parliamentary Commission that, in fact, Licio Gelli had helped found the Red Brigades. Also uh, consider the possible involvement of U.S. intelligence with the resurgence of the Red Brigades, and we're going to be coming back to that in later broadcasts. And again, Alberto de, Al, General Carlo Alberto della Chiesa had been investigating the Red Brigades, apparently with active opposition from a group affiliated with the P2 and located within the Milan Carabinieri. We're going to be looking at uh, more of the, uh, the interesting P2 machinations on both sides of the fence a little later in the broadcast. Right now, we're going to take a look at the death of Mino Pecarelli and the circumstances surrounding it. Turning to uh, a book which we've relied on very heavily in the past, and we're going to be using again, obviously, this evening, the book is In God's Name, subtitled An Investigation into the Murder of Pope John Paul I, authored by David Yallop, published in hardcover by Bantam Books, copyrighted 1984. Of the death of Mino Pecarelli, and recall now that uh, some of his journal, some of his diary with regard to the Morrow case was missing, Yallop writes as follows. Before that problem was resolved, that, uh, by the way, is the problem... Uh, of Roberto Calvi in the investigation into his financial affairs. Before that problem was resolved, there was, however, another matter causing the Masons of P2 considerable concern. 
This was the problem posed by lawyer and journalist Mino Pecorelli, P-E-C-O-R-E-L-L-I. Among Pecorelli's many activities was that of editing an unusual weekly emanating from the agency referred to earlier, O.P. O.P., the name of the weekly, has been described as muckraking and scandalistic, unquote. It was both. It was also accurate. Throughout the 1970s, it acquired and subsequently printed an astonishing number of exposés and allegations on Italian corruption. It became required reading for anyone who was interested in knowing exactly who was robbing them. Despite Italy's stringent libel laws, it led a charmed life. Pecorelli clearly had access to highly sensitive information. Italian journalists frequently went into print with OP-inspired articles. Privately, they tried to ascertain who was behind this weekly, which was clearly above the law, but OP remained a mystery. Pecorelli's sister Rosita alleged during a television interview that the news agency OP was financed by Prime Minister Andriotti. In the early 1970s, the name of Michele Sindona was frequently linked with OP. Pecorelli obviously had had sources working within the Italian Secret Service, but his major contacts were inside an organization more powerful and indeed more secret than such official government agencies. Mino Pecorelli was a member of P2, and it was from this illegal Masonic lodge that he derived much of the information that set the Italian news media buzzing. At one lodge meeting, Licio Gelli invited members to contribute documents and information that would be passed on to OP. The primary function of OP during this period was, therefore, to further Gelli's ambitions and the aims of P2. In mid-1978, however, Pecorelli decided on a little private enterprise, blackmail. He obtained information about one of the biggest thefts in Italian financial history. The mastermind behind the theft was Licio Gelli. The scheme was responsible for robbing Italy of $2.5 billion in oil tax revenues. In Italy, the same petroleum product is used to heat buildings as to drive diesel trucks. The oil for heating is dyed to distinguish it from that used for vehicles and is taxed at a rate 50 times lower than the diesel fuel. It was a situation ready-made for a criminal such as Gelli. Under his guidance, oil magnate Bruno Musselli, a P2 member, doctored the dyes. The head of the finance police, General Raffaele Giudice, a P2 member, falsified the paperwork to ensure that all the fuel was taxed at the lower rate. The fuel was then sold to petroleum outlets, which paid the conspirators at the higher rate. The profits were then transferred, thanks to P2 member Michele Sindona, through the Vatican Bank to a series of secret accounts at Sindona's Swiss bank, Finabank. Licio Gelli became a familiar sight walking through the St. Anne Gate with large suitcases containing billions of stolen lira. General Giudice had been appointed head of the finance police by Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti, a close friend of Licio Gelli. This particular appointment had been made after Cardinal Poletti, Cardinal Vicar of Rome, had written to the Prime Minister strongly recommending Giudice for the post. Poletti, it will be recalled, was one of the men Albino Luciani had planned to remove from Rome. The Vatican link with the scandal was unknown to Pecorelli, but he knew enough about this gigantic theft of government revenue to begin publishing small tidbits of information. A deputation that included Christian Democrat Senator Claudio Vitaloni, Judge Carlo Testi, and General Donato Loprete of the Finance Police bought his silence. The articles on the scandal ceased. Realizing that more money could be obtained by such dubious techniques, Pecorelli began to write about the Freemasons. His issue of early September 1978, containing incredibly the names of over 100 Vatican Freemasons, had been a warning shot across Jelly's bows. The fact that a copy arrived on the desk of Albino Luciani, who, having carefully checked it, began to act upon the information, was the supreme irony for Jelly, who was already acutely aware of the threat Luciani posed to his paymaster, Roberto Calvi. With Luciani dead, Jelly attempted to deal with Pecorelli. Jelly bribed him. Inevitably, Pecorelli demanded more money for his silence. Jelly refused to pay. Pecorelli published the first of what he promised would be a series of articles. It revealed that Jelly, the pillar of extreme right-wing fascism, had spied for the communists during the war and had continued to work for them afterward. Pecorelli having now embraced the mantle of a fearless investigative journalist, promised his readers he would reveal everything about P2. For good measure, he revealed that Licio Gelli, former Nazi, ex-fascist, and late communist, also had very strong links with the CIA. Pecorelli had revealed so much of the truth that his colleagues in P2 concluded that he had betrayed them. On March 20th, 1979, Gelli telephoned Pecorelli at his Rome office. He suggested a peace talk over dinner the following day, if that is convenient, unquote. It was. During the course of the conversation, Pecorelli mentioned that he would be working late at the office that evening, but dinner on the following day would be possible. 
It was a dinner that Pecorelli never ate. Mino Pecorelli left his office on Via Orazio at 9.15 p.m. and headed toward his car parked a short distance away. The two bullets that killed him as he sat in his car were fired from within his mouth, a classic Sicilian mafia gesture of sasso in bocca, a rock in the mouth of a dead man to demonstrate that he will talk no more. Unable to have dinner with his old friend, Licio Jelly used, used the time to open his secret files of P2 members and write, write deceased alongside the entry for Mino Pecorelli. No one has ever claimed responsibility for Pecorelli's murder, but in 1983, Antonio Viezer, V-I-E-Z-Z-E-R, at one time a high-ranking officer in SID, Italy's Secret Service, was arrested and charged on suspicion of involvement in the killing of Pecorelli. Antonio Viezer was a member of P2. So uh, this is the man whose diary was missing key pages with regard to Aldo Moro, also one of a growing number of people who ran afoul of the Jelly Combine and basically were, was liquidated by that very same combine. It's interesting to note that uh, apparently one of the straws that helped to break the camel's back uh, was in fact, um, among other things, the suggestion that uh, Licio Jelly was intimately connected to the American CIA. Um, one can suggest uh, for a variety of reasons um, why this might be, um, particularly at one of them, of course, the fact that the Italian CIA's involvement in, I mean, the American CIA's involvement in Italian politics um, itself is something that uh, is not something the CIA wants talked about a great deal. Uh, but then on top of it, the things, as we are talking about tonight and will continue to talk about, the things that uh, the CIA has been involved in have been some of the most scandalous episodes in Italian political history and not the kind of thing that a democratic country uh, like the United States exactly wants to identify um, as far as the... Uh, as far as uh, the kinds of things that they subsidize. And we have subsidized them with a large amount of money. Okay, we're going to read an article um, called The Business of Terrorism by Jonathan Marshall from his journal Parapolitics from March 31st, 1982. And it's going to follow in some of the same footsteps we have been following in. If that makes any sense. Okay, um, Marshall writes as follows. But it is the far right in Italy that has had the longest history of ties to organized crime going back to the early days after World War II, when monarchist and neo-fascist separatists in Sicily backed Salvatore Giuliano, a leading gangster, in his massacres of leftist political opponents. More recently, the fascist mafia, mafia alliance was exemplified by the formation, around 1973, of the informal Anonima Sequestri by the former monarchist Carlo Fumagalli, who led the band in kidnapping an industrialist in the north and also engaged in gold and counterfeit money traffics. On the Mafia side, the organization was said to be headed by the much-feared Luciano Ligio, an experienced kidnapper. Um, by the way, according to the man Frederick Laurent, who wrote the book L'Orchestre Noir, uh, the black orchestra about this kind of thing, um, Carlo Fumagalli, who they're talking to, um, also worked for the CIA in the 1950s. One of the leading affiliates of Anonima Sequestri, or this kidnap gang, was the so-called Italo Marseille gang, headed by Albert Bergamelli, perpetrator of the notorious holdup at the Colombo jewelry, jewelry store in Milan in 1964. Bergamelli's gang pulled off numerous profitable kidnappings in Italy in 1974 and 75, including, in the latter year, the seizure of Amadeo Maria Ortolani, a rich businessman. The reason for the Ortolani, by the way, um, this I believe is the son of um, our other uh, Ortolani, whose first name just skipped my mind. Umberto. Oh, Umberto. He, he'll be uh, mentioned a little later in the same passage here. And, uh, yes, and, and it's because of a little spat between Umberto and Licio Gelli. Um, so anyway, so Bergamelli's gang, not only involved in the Colombo jewelry store heist, but also in the seizure of Amadeo Maria Ortolani. The reason for the Ortolani kidnapping became apparent after Bergamelli's arrest in March 1976, on the orders of Judge Vittorio Accorsio, Bergamelli boasted as he was captured, quote, I am a Nazi. A great family protects me, unquote. On March 30, 1976, Bergamelli's attorney, Giantonio Mingelli, was also arrested and accused of laundering money from kidnappings. Mingelli was a fascist and also an attorney for Adriano Tilger, chief of the terrorist Avangardia Nazionale. The family that protected Bergamelli turned out to be the P2 Lodge, headed by Licio Gelli, and whose organizational secretary was Mingelli himself. At the end of 1976, a dissident mason, Francesco Siniscalchi, denounced P2 as a fascist front. Besides Gelli, who had been active with last-ditch Italian fascists in the Republic of Salò in the end of World War II, the lodge included Vito Micelli, 
former head of the Italian intelligence agency, SID, a fascist MSI deputy. MSI is the the neo-fascist party in Italy. And suspected of complicity in the December 1970 coup plot of Prince Borghese. Carmelo Spagnolo, former chief judicial officer in Rome. Edgardo Sogno, or Sogno, or Sogno, a known coup plotter of monarchist sympathies, and General Ugo Ricci, implicated with the shadow, the shadowy Rosa de Venti, that's a coup group, in terrorist acts and coup planning. The Italian magistrate Accorsio, even before Siniscalchi's revelations, had begun investigating whether Bergamelli's ransoms financed Jelly's paper organization to aid Masons, O-M-P-A-M. It appeared from Siniscalchi's revelation that Jelly had ordered the kidnapping of Ortolani to punish Ortolani's father, Umberto, a fellow P2 member with whom he was feuding. If so, they soon patched up their differences. Jelly used his Peronist connections to help Ortolani expand his Argentine business interests. And after Jelly was forced to flee Italy in the wake of the 1981 P2 scandal, Ortolani helped him find refuge in Latin America. Ocorsio didn't live long enough to see the investigation completed. It was Judge Ocorsio, by all accounts, who began and then so tenaciously pursued the inquiry into fascist criminal ties. It was fitting, therefore, that he died at the hands of that same combine. His chief killer, Pier Luigi Concutelli, was a former leader of the fascist Ordine Nuovo, who had become military commander of a new fascist united front formed in the winter of 1975 out of several organizations, including Ordine Nuovo and Avangardia Nazionale. Okay, skipping down. The most notorious of all Italian kidnappers, as we have seen, was mafia boss Luciano Luciano Ligio, L-I-G-G-I-O, nominal head of Anonima Sequestri. His organization took in hundreds of millions of lira as it perfected techniques for holding luckless businessmen up for ransom. When Italian police finally arrested him in 1974, they found in his possession the secret telephone number of Ugo De Luca. Ligio's lieutenants also had the number. De Luca was the head of Banco di Milano, which he ran for Sicilian financier Michele Sindona. De Luca apparently specialized in the wholesale export of dirty mafia money, especially to Canada. Sindona was no better. He has recently been indicted in Italy for complicity in narcotics trafficking. But of greater political significance is the fact that Sindona, a member of the P2 Lodge, was a key participant at a March 1973 strategy session of Rosa de Venti, a powerful coup group with members high in the Italian military. Otto Scorzani, the Nazi commando turned arms agent, was a key backer of the Rosa conspiracy, just as he had supplied arms to the Borghese Putsch attempt of December 1970. Before we move on to the third part of this article, it might be worth uh, recapping a little bit of what we've seen so far. We've been looking at a combined P2 organized crime kidnapping ring called Anomine Sequestri with links not only to organized crime in the P2, but also going back to the CIA. Anomine Sequestri involving, among others, a Sindona bank, and significantly here, uh, in the background of Anomine Sequestri, we're getting into a series of, of attempted coup d'etat in Italy. The aforementioned Borghese coup of December 1970, which we're going to be looking at in just a second, recall that that was financed in part by the CIA, again with money coming through Michele Sindona. It's worth noting that Otto Scorzani, Hitler's commando and a CIA agent and Galen agent, a key Galen agent, we looked at uh, in numerous broadcasts in the past, notably Radio Free America number three about the Galen organization, Otto Scorzani is a key participant not only, or is supplying arms not only to the Borghese Pooch of 1970, along with P2, Sindona, and CIA, but also the Rosa de Venti, along with the very same P2, Sindona, and CIA. In fact, we're going to be looking at a whole series of uh, coup attempts involving that milieu. Okay. Now, next, we're going to be reading from a Parapolitics article by Jerry Weldon, uh, by Jerry Meldon, excuse me. This, from the, by the way, from the same issue of Parapolitics. We're going to be reading about a German arms combine called Merex, M-E-R-E-X, headed up by a man named Gerhard Mertens, M-E-R-T-E-N-S. And interestingly enough, um, just as we talked a little bit about some of the connections there with Ortolani and Licio Gelli into Italy, I mean into Argentina, um, we're going to find out about some of the ties between the P2 and this German combine, which is also very heavily involved with the BND, the German equivalent of the CIA. By the way, remember the two names, uh, Pierluigi Concutelli, the person who assassinated Judge Vittorio Accorsio, looking into P2 and its connections with a nomine sequestri. Okay. 
Reading again from this article entitled German Bruhaha by Jerry Meldon. Mertens, again Gerhard Mertens, had for, founded Merex in 1963 with the help of Otto Skorzeny of the SS, his wartime commandant with whom he remained closely associated through the 1960s. Skorzeny was the daredevil who saved Mussolini's life in 1943 and escaped punishment for war crimes including the alleged torture and murder of over 100 American POWs. According to Der Spiegel and Nouvelle Observateur, he went on to become the post-war head of the Paladin Group, an international mercenary combine based in Spain and composed of right-wing soldiers of fortune, including many former OAS terrorists, and parenthetically we should just mention also including Muammar Gaddafi, according to the Great Heroin Coup. We're going to be coming back to that in considerable detail next week. When in February 1977, Italian police arrested the neo-fascist leader Pierluigi Concutelli, for the 1976 murder of Rome Judge Vittorio Accorsio, they discovered, according to the magazine Giorni, not only the murder weapon, but also proof that the right-wing terrorists had been receiving arms shipments from none other than Merex. The middleman was one Guido Giannettini, an informer for the Italian secret police who had close connections in the German BND, and who this past February was sentenced to life in prison for his role in the 1969 bombing of a Milan bank that took 16 lives. And, of course, that's the Banca dell'Agricoltura that we talked about earlier in the broadcast. That bombing, of course, part of the strategy of tension financed in part by CIA, and recall that Guido Giannatini was not only a key member of the SID, but also a key member of P2, and allegedly the head of Terzo Posizioni, a cadaver oriented group in P2. And uh, we'll be talking more about Terza Posizioni next week as well. In the mid-1960s, an Indian magazine revealed the connection between Merex and the BND, which was then headed by Hitler's master spy on the Eastern Front, Reinhard Galen. However, that did not put a stop to the arms trade. Instead, the intelligence agency decided, according to Gerhard Vessel's 1976 testimony, to find, quote, a more proper firm. Okay, now, one of the things that's important here, one of the things that's very important, is the intrusion uh, for the first time in this broadcast of the BND into the involvement, uh, into these various things. Now, again, we're talking about a direct connection between uh, Pierluigi Concutelli, uh, Guido G Giannettini, uh, both of them involved with with uh, with parafascist politics in Italy, their connections to Merex, this uh, this right wing, this German arms company, and Merex's connections to the BND. Now we've talked a lot in the past about the history of the BND, how it sprang out of the Galen organization, which was first Hitler's Eastern Front intelligence organization, then the CIA's Eastern Front intelligence organization, then NATO's uh, Eastern Front intelligence organization, and finally became the underpinnings for the German, West German CIA. Now, the BND is going to crop up later on um, in, the, in the series of broadcasts, very specifically in terms of their involvement with, A, Turkish neo-Nazis, of which Mehmet Ali Ajah, the would-be assassin of the Pope, was one, and also with the transshipment of arms in and out of Europe um, under cover of, quote-unquote, leftist political activities, but in reality, direct involvement of the West German intelligence services. So Giannatini, participant in the Piazza Fontana bombing with uh, CIA funding, participant with Stefano Della Chiai, participant with, uh, well, uh, with other members of SID. <laughs> Basically, this operation is not only CIA, but BND as well. Also, remember the name Merex, because we're going to be touching back on the Merex firm later in the broadcast. Podcast ...when a judge named Alessandrini who was investigating Roberto Calvi's and P2's financial machinations, was, right at the time when he began not only investigating P2, but other right-wing terrorism, gunned down by the very Prima Linnea terrorist group, which was just referred to. Supposed left-wing terrorist group. Now, we're looking at a pattern here uh, of that we're going to be developing for quite some time, and it's going to figure prominently in the broadcasts to come. Namely, the killing of someone supposedly by the left whose actions were about to benefit the very left, and of course that killing then serving to discredit the left. In this case, the prominent player here is Aldo Moro. And before we get to Aldo Moro, and from there to a variety of other things, uh, the strategy of tension in general, and the further um, infiltration of Sismi into every, uh, every possible uh, area of political life, and uh, the, the cross- uh, infiltration of Seize Me by P2, we are going to take a break. So I want to mention to you, broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills, 
Uh, Dave and I will be back after just a couple of minutes since you've all been sitting for about an hour, those of you who are listening. And uh, we will continue with Radio Free America. And, of course, we are here in the studios of KFJC. And uh, we're going to recap the last article, and we're going to go on to talk a little bit about Seize Me and Lisio Jelly in P2. Basically, what the last article called appropriately enough Italy's Secret Service Wars was about was just that. It was how, like with so many other countries at the end of World War II, the United States and Britain, in reconstituting Italy's Secret Service, based, certainly at this time, the Red Brigades and their right-wing counterparts enjoyed a sudden, unexpected upsurge which reached a climax in the Morrow case. This ended any chance of communist participation in government, which would have undermined U.S. plans to make Italy's, n- Italy NATO's aircraft carrier, unquote, in the Mediterranean. Terrorist leaders arrested over the past two years after brief and spectacular careers have mostly proved to be very ready to repent, unquote, and confess. And their confessions have provided legal justification for a further clampdown on the left and for press campaigns against Arab and specifically Libyan and Palestinian support for European terrorism, unquote. Efforts by Premier Francesco Cossiga of the Christian Democratic Left to increase Siste's powers were foiled by Sisme-inspired attacks on its leadership. Confidential statements to the judge by repentant Red Brigade leader Patrizio Pecci had described the prominent role in the Prima Linnea terrorist group of the son of Carlo Donat Catin, C-A-T-T-I-N, leader of the Christian Democratic anti-communist right. These were leaked to the daily Il Massaggero, and Silvano Russomano, deputy chief of Sisde, was help, held responsible. Russomano went to prison, and Sisde was discredited. A lot of things in this passage to look at, uh, starting with the very last point, taking a look at the allegedly leftist terrorist group Prima Linnea, and the fact that one of its key principles was of a rightist and the son of a prominent Christian democratic anti-communist. Well, uh, we've seen Prima Linnea in our last broadcast. Basically, simply reinstalled the same fascist elements who had performed intelligence functions for Benito Mussolini for the better part of two decades. Now, as a result of that, there was an ongoing conflict between the democratic dictates of the Italian political uh, constitution and the practices and, and political aspirations of its security services. This resulted in a program not only of state terrorism by those security services, but in the periodic disillusioned. Dissolution, dissolution, excuse me, and realignment of those very same security services. Now, what we got out of eventually the Italian Secret Service Wars, as it could be termed, was a bifocal Italian service intelligence system with two services: SISDE, the less, the more progressive and less powerful, and the SISMI. And in particular, one of the names to remember with the SISMI, the S-I-S-M-I, the more reactionary and more powerful of the Italian secret services, is the name Giuseppe Santovito, a P2 member who we're going to come back to a little later. Now, in the beginning of the broadcast, we took a look at the Strategy of Tension, a program by Italian fascist Stefano Della Chiai to attribute bombings to the left to not only discredit the left, but precipitate a fascist coup. He was joined in this not only by the CIA with money going through Michele Sindona, another P- key P2 member, but also with a, with a man named Guido Giannatini, an SID member, a P2 member, and a fellow we're going to be looking at a little later. Now, we were looking at how in 1977, just as the Red Brigades and fascist terrorists were being effectively subdued by the Carabinieri, the Italian militia, how, according to uh, Middle East Magazine, and we're going to look at information which will work to corroborate this in our subsequent broadcasts, the CIA, among others, advocated the, I guess you could say, the restarting up of terrorism, the resurgence of terrorism, as a means of not only infiltrating those, those very same terrorist groups, but obviously using those for political reaction, to promote political reaction. Specifically, we we left off looking at the kidnapping and assassination of Aldo Moro by the Red Brigades. Moro, the uh, Prime Minister of Italy, was in the business, uh, where he was in the process, I should say, of incorporating the communists into Italian government for the first time. Italy has uh, what I believe is still the largest communist party in all of Western Europe, and it's also uh, a very powerful and effective communist party, also very democratic, by the way, and uh, which which leads us... uh, to perhaps question, as we will a little later, we'll just where the Red Brigades come from. But uh, Aldo Moro was, was becoming the first Italian head of state to incorporate the communists as part of a center-left coalition. At that time, at that precise moment, the Red Brigades kidnapped and murdered Aldo Moro, obviously creating a, a great deal of disfavor for the left. It should be noted that in that capacity, the Red Brigades acted 
in accordance with the wishes not only of the United States Intelligence Services, but also of fascists all over Italy, including Licio Gelli of the P2 Lodge. Okay, now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to read an article entitled, Wanted Men Enjoying Power, from the New Statesman of September 21st, 1984. Research credit on this goes to Ted Ru Okay, continuing now. Remember Santa Vito, one of the key players, and uh, sees me as perhaps the key player in what we're going to be looking at this evening. Continuing, from Middle East of July of 81. The right gained control of Seize Me and managed to ensure that the parliamentary and ministerial committees charged with political control over both services were unable to interfere. As a consequence, both increasingly became the instruments of the unending war between different factions within the establishment. SISD, S I S D E, is generally more Arab, uh, more pro Arab and pro left, and Seize Me works closely with the CIA and other Western and pro Western security services, including the Israeli Mossad. It also has links with both local and international rightist organizations. We'll look at those later. <clears throat> Continuing. By 1977, the Italian police were making great headway in their struggle against terrorism. Almost all the original leaders of the Red Brigades had been arrested, and right-wing subversion had been reduced to a minimum. But a secret document attributed to the CIA, whose authenticity the American agency denied, advocated encouraging the continuation of terrorism so that the networks could be infiltrated until they were virtually controlled by the security apparatus. Thus it was alleged, this it was alleged, would make possible the wholesale criminalization of the Marxist and liberal left, providing a pretext for the repressive measures deemed necessary to keep Italy in the Western camp and prevent its slide toward non-alignment disarm disarmament and particularly an independent Middle East strategy. 